Hello, my name's Phil Dawson, and I'd like to talk with you about scholarship of learning and teaching. But first, let's play a guessing game. Uh, in what area can you conduct research without having studied in the area? Without having read the relevant research? Without uh, really getting the methodology? And, and actually publish without having any data at all? And maybe even get research grants without a relevant track record? Now, if you guessed scholarship of learning and teaching, you're a bit of a cynic, but in some people's eyes, you might actually be on the money. Scholarship of learning and teaching is a much maligned field, and there's a little bit of truth to each one of those statements there. Let's have a bit of a chat about it. So, I'm from the Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning. Um, we are based in the CBD. And we are led by Professor David Bowd. Now, Professor David Bowd is not guilty of any of the former things. He's a very highly cited assessment researcher, more than 25,000 citations to his work. So I put us and David Bowd in here to say, although there are some uh, wishy-washy scholarship of learning and teaching types, there's also people who rival the top researchers in any field for impact, for rigor, for quality. So this is us. Please come and have a chat to us. And here's an example of some recent scholarship of teaching and learning work that we've done. Now, it's a bit hard to say, is this scholarship of teaching and learning or is it educational research? So we went out and talked to more than 30 academics about how they do assessment design. And we used qualitative methods, analyzed the data, um, through thematic analysis and combination with existing literature, we identified a bunch of different influences on assessment design work, and we produced a bunch of different things, some research papers and some resources for practitioners. Uh, and this is sort of that scholarship of teaching and learning thing, uh, not a pure research goal, but also not a pure practice goal something that sits part way in between the two. If you're interested in that project or interested in doing better assessment design work, please see the website assessmentdecisions.org. So in this video, I'm going to talk about scholarship of learning and teaching, defining it, critiquing it, talking about subtle in academic work and careers, and then talking about the sort of support that exists if you're interested in conducting subtle. So defining SOTL, or should that be SALT? Um, people sort of think that by putting the learning before the teaching, you're putting the learning before the teaching. Let's not get into that. Now, the definitions of it are contested. Um, if you want to talk about the contestation of the definitions, I've got a reference to that at the end. Uh, most of our definitions of scholarship of teaching and learning have within them the ultimate goal of improving learning. So this is not just an academic exercise. It's not just a pure research exercise. It's a field with a mission to improve learning and teaching. Uh, the Wikipedia article curated by the International Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning says, Sottle is scholarly inquiry into student learning which advances the practice of teaching by making research findings public. So there's a pretty research-centric understanding of Sottle. Uh, another alternative is that the aim of scholarly teaching is also simple. It is to make transparent how we have made learning possible. For this to happen, university teachers must be informed of the theoretical perspectives and literature of teaching and learning in their discipline. So this is the understanding that subtle doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's not navel-gazing. You've got to read, you've got to understand relevant theory. And be able to collect and present rigorous evidence of their effectiveness from these perspectives as teachers. Uh, so it's not just navel-gazing, it's also not just reading. It's collecting rigorous data, it's a research act, it's empirical. In turn, this involves reflection, inquiry, evaluation, documentation, and communication. So a sort of sharing element. And this is from uh, Keith Trig Trigwell et al. Uh, Sally Kift says, it's, it's sort of the difference between having the vision, design, outcomes in learning and teaching, and adding on Ethics, evaluation, and analysis. 
Now, Sally Kift's an important person in the scholarship of learning and teaching. She's someone who, through this field, has gone from being a sort of coalface learning and teaching good teacher type through a very rapid rise to professorship and now deputy vice chancellorship of a university. And it's through these sorts of practices that she's been able to have that amazing rise. Now, my personal critique of Sottle. I, I haven't had the amazing career rise, but I can say it is thanks to the scholarship of teaching and learning that I'm where I am today. So I say this from within the field. Scholarship of teaching and learning kind of privileges publishing grants and awards. Um, these are sort of the outputs. This can lead to sort of personal glory for the scholarly teacher. And I have scholarly teacher in there because there's a bunch of people not doing the publishing grants and awards that are probably pretty scholarly, pretty good teachers, but they're just not getting the glory. It also leads to methodologically poor studies that are atheoretical, don't connect to the literature and make little impact. Um, if you go to the higher education research literature, there are a hell of a lot of journals. And there's a huge chunk of these journals that kind of publish pretty low quality stuff. That really pollutes the field of higher education research. And it also sort of messes with the university's research quality. Uh, scholarship of teaching and learning encourages teachers to write and do, but not necessarily to read. And all of this does not necessarily improve outcomes for students. We may have this as part of our mission. It doesn't always happen. So I have anxieties about Sottle. So what's quality Sottle look like? Well, I'm going to talk about reading versus writing and where you might want to start with reading and methodology as well. So my pitch to you, start by reading, not by writing. The amount of people that embark on their scholarship of learning and teaching venture by thinking about the paper that they're going to write first without having read the relevant work and actually maybe even starting writing that paper without having read. Oh, it's scary. And if you want to do this efficiently, I think you should start with a review study. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of review studies in the scholarship of teaching and learning. But I want to first say review studies are not some bizarre higher education research tradition. Uh, review studies, I'm almost 100% sure they exist in the field that you are expert in. You may know about this. You also might not know about this. I, I've come across sort of 20-30% uh, of academics that will fight black and blue with me that I'm making up this review study thing and that it's some weird education thing. It's not. If I have a PhD student in a field, I say, hey, go and find a good review study in that field. Now with Sotl, because we're kind of talking about action, there's this argument that rather than evaluate after we do something, we should actually examine the evidence before we do it. We should find out, is doing this thing even a good idea? And review studies bring together what we know about a topic. They gather together vast amounts of research. These are laborious sorts of research studies to do. Uh, they make research findings accessible and efficient. You only got to read one paper to get a reasonable gist of the whole field. And they provide a starting point. They're not the ending point. And they guide future research and policy. So here are two good sources of review studies. The Herds of Review of Higher Education is put out by the Higher Education Research and Development Society of Australasia. It's a free, open access, practitioner targeted journal. Um, Herds of hopes that everyday academics are reading this to get a grasp of you know, fundamental learning and teaching things in a rigorous way and also that the big bosses are reading this too. Then on the more sort of educational research end, you've got review of educational research, which is not higher ed specific, but it does publish a lot of studies about higher ed. So here are two good places. They're where I go when I want to find out about a new field. Now, a note on methodology. You might have read some uh, higher education research studies and felt happy, sad, impressed, unimpressed about how they came to know the things they claim. 
And what I can say is that the research methodologies of your discipline are probably acceptable in Sotl when they're done well. I'm a pragmatist, um, and I've got a reference to a paper there in the end, um, and I try to choose the appropriate method or methodology for the appropriate question. I'm not interested in some sort of qualitative, quantitative, false dichotomy, uh, the quant guys against the qual guys. That's, that's actually quite boring and dated. Uh, now, within all of this, although you can apply the methodologies you know, bad research is still bad subtle. So if you're interested in publishing a paper with cherry-picked quotes, and, and calling that qualitative research, or sort of dodgy descriptive statistics and claiming you're doing some sort of great quant research, that won't make it great subtle. The, the cynic in me says you'll probably still get published, and I'm really sad about that. So, going to jump on to subtle and academic work and academic careers. Going to talk about three views, Trigwell et al. progressing through subtle, Sally Kift, Sotl as a career pathway, and Carolyn Krieber talking about excellent expert or scholarly teachers. Now, here is Trigwell's approach. I encourage you to have a look at the paper. There's this understanding that Sotl has a bunch of different dimensions to it, sort of the degree to which you're informed and what you're informed by. You've probably seen novice teachers use kind of informal theories of teaching and learning, you know, what they've sort of learned. Uh, you might have some colleagues that engage with the literature of learning and teaching. Uh, you, you might have seen people really engage with discipline learning and teaching literature. So things like Journal of Engineering Education or Accounting Education, those sorts of places. Or even people that really take that a step further and conduct research. And across a bunch of different dimensions, Trigwell et al. identify these gradations of... Uh, sort of engagement in a scholarly process around teaching. Sally Kift talks about a sort of progression through a career as a scholarly teacher. Uh, this paper is a little bit old. It refers to the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. Um, that's, that's long gone, but it's been replaced by successor bodies. Um, but sort of that a beginner teacher is engaged in scholarly acts of preparing and delivering course materials, mentored by others, uh, and that gradually you progress through maybe starting to get awards for learning and teaching or taking on a leadership role. Uh, that there's sort of a bit of a bar around being a scholarly teacher or local learning and teaching leader and really properly beginning scholarship of learning and teaching when you start to share things in public peer-reviewed journals. And, you know, progressing on to school leadership positions, um, maybe participating in grants and fellowships and whatever. Now, Sally Kift's in a position to write about this stuff because she's seen this occur across the sector and she's also had that sort of career success through this pathway. This sort of list of pathways speaks to me. It, I have to say I consciously used this you know, career pathway thing when developing my own career and even when applying for promotion, applying for new higher up jobs, I've been able to say, hey, I'm, I'm actually operating at this sort of a level. I'm more advanced than you might think. So, that sort of argument. Now, Krieber puts forward what I think is a really valuable argument. Uh, do you want to be excellent, expert, or scholarly in your teaching? So, excellent teachers, according to Krieber, are excellent because of things like student evaluations, excellent learning outcomes. They might be people who win teaching awards. That might actually be all your goal is as a teacher is just to be a really good teacher. And I really respect that. The university doesn't need everyone to be scholarly teachers. Uh, so if you're feeling some sort of pressure to be scholarly teacher, then, then don't. Being an excellent teacher is a fine goal to have. Now, being an expert teacher, according to Krieber, is having all of the above, plus a clear rationale, plus evidence, plus systematicity and qualifications. So things like graduate certificate sort of qualifications in learning and teaching at university. Uh, this is where I'd actually love teachers at university to all be. 
I, I think it's not okay for teaching to be an amateur sort of practice. Teaching is an expert practice. We should strive for expertise. So uh, certificate qualifications, that sort of thing, I'm totally pro them. Now to take it a step further, being a scholarly teacher is all of the above, plus studying, analysing, publishing, reviewing and advancing education beyond your own context. And to Kriba, that's the key thing. Taking your focus beyond just your immediate context to the broader world, sharing. Uh, I think this is a beautiful thing. That's where I like to see myself and that's where I focus my career. Now. You might be interested in learning more about this or collaborating with people. I encourage you to get in touch with us. Cradle, Centre for Research and Assessment Digital Learning, offers research seminars, collaboration on research, big and small, advice and mentoring about research, and a community and network. Now, I've got to say, we're more on the assessment side of the assessment and digital learning and we're also more on the research side of things so we're not interested in sort of routine uh, development of good practice but we are interested in where that intersects with amazing interesting research so if you are too come talk to us you also might be interested in the higher education research and development society of australasia herdza has some great publications including that review journal which i think you should have a look at uh, they're also an international network. It's Australasia. Uh, they have an annual conference, which is a great place to get started in SOTL. I, I really encourage that. They have things like new scholars events where you can get connected with other new scholars. Um, and Herdzer also has a network of local branches in each state of Australia uh, and events. So really great ways to find out what other people are doing. So here's two really great options if you want to get involved in SOTL. Thanks a lot.